What I try and do is come up with something that you wouldn't get anywhere else. You don't quite get it at a play, you don't get it at a magic show. I really try and come up with something that's unique and, and also that over delivers, that give you more than you, than you were expecting. I want to start by saying that a lot of people have tried to categorise you and they do you know, a review of you or write about you, um, but it's very hard to categorise you, so I'm very interested in finding out how you categorise you. Ooh, um, I like the fact that I've sort of managed to avoid it. I think it makes it, uh, it, makes it easier to do all sorts of different things. So like in the UK, the other year I had a, a book out on happiness, which was sort of basically about Greek philosophy and a, a TV show that involved someone getting murdered and a ghost train, a VR ghost train. So it's quite nice that I've sort of, I've, so I've purposely managed to avoid it. Um, in terms of the stage show that I do and everything that, so I've had like a 20 year career back home, so it's, it's sort of done this over the years. But what it goes back to, I guess, is a psychological form of magic. So mind reading and influence and that kind of thing. It isn't psychic and it isn't, uh, uh, you know, it's a mixture of conjuring techniques and genuine uh, psychological techniques. Um, and it's a show that's about more than that. It's about the stories that we tell ourselves, the narratives that we live by. I think those things are, it's about the audience essentially, which is always more going to be more interesting than me. But yeah, I don't know. I don't really know. I don't know. One of the difficult things about any sort of magic, and I've got one foot very firmly planted in that, is that it's, it's just this quick route to Im impressing people. And, and um, I think for that reason, magicians tend to be interesting for a little while and then become sort of figures of fun or dislike because you, it's sort of posturing after a while, isn't it? I think there's, um, there's a thing with magic that, because it's basically about impressing people, that at its core, and I've definitely got one foot in magic, it's a big, you know, it's definitely part of what I do. There's this subtext that's always just, look at me, aren't I clever? And I think it, that interested me at the start when that was important to me. But now, I think if there's anything that makes the show I do different, it's that it really isn't about me. It's a show very much about, about the audience. So I think it's also important for any kind of longevity in this sort of career, because magicians are often intriguing for a couple of years and then become figures of fun, because we sense there's a lot of posturing. There's all the really interesting stuff about magic you often you can't talk about as a magician. Mm. It's the stuff you have to keep hidden. Whereas I try and bring that into it. What, what fascinates me about any sort of magic is that it's it's a great analogy for how we interpret the world. So we, here we, we live in this infinite data source. There's all this stuff going on. There's an infinite number of things that we could pay attention to, but we edit and delete and we choose what we're going to pay attention to. And we make up this story and then we mistake that story for the truth and we live by that. And when a magician shows you a trick, he's manipulating that process of how we, is guiding how we edit uh, uh, reality to form this sort of story that's amazing. But we're doing it all the time. And particularly in this day and age where we're all told to own our narratives and so on, that's as important as that is, it can miss the point that they're still just stories. And it took me 20 years of touring in the UK to realise the value of that, that, that there's always this other stuff going on that we don't know about. And we sense that with a magician, but we sort of often forget that in life and I think it's an important thing to remember. You've done so many different types of live shows, you have TV specials. When it comes to starting to work on something like, how do you approach it? How do you even start to have that initial idea of what an entire show is going to be? My starting point is always, I've got a couple of thousand people locked in a room with me and I sort of have carte blanche to do anything, so what would be an interesting thing to take people through? Um, so it starts with that and then the next thing is sort of theatrical moments, like things that you just know would be, for an audience member, oh, wow. interesting or tense or extraordinary to, to go through. And, you know, we don't always hit that. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, the, the early stages as you're thinking, you know, what, what should it be? But that's sort of, it's all based on that. And then way after that comes the actual tricks, the things that I'm doing. Um, and uh, it's, Often the other way around with traditional magic, you tend to start with the, the method and then from the method you build the trick and then from the trick it just the show is whatever it is. But I've always worked the other way, very much starting from uh, what the audience experience is. Because my toolkit is the, is the ongoing experience of, of an audience member. That's, that's equivalent to my deck of cards or, or whatever. Is it um, fair to say that you almost like think about what the, the, the big aha moment is and work backwards from yeah, there? It's, what, what, I, what I try and do is come up with something that you wouldn't get anywhere else. You don't quite get it at a play, 
You don't get it at a magic show. You, it's a, I really try and come up with something that's unique and, and also that over delivers, that give you more than you, than you were expecting. What happens when you, you, know, you sit down and you've, you, the tickets have been sold and it's, the, the creativity is not coming to you? How do you, I think everyone struggles with that at some point in their careers, like yeah. has that ever happened and how do you deal with that? But when? That's why I think working with a couple of other people is important. So we've worked together from day one. I think there's a certain madness that creeps in when people work with like a writing partner and then after a while, particularly if they themselves have become the sort of the, the star, the on-screen person when they decide they can do it on their own and the, the product is never as good, you know, the end result is never as good. The, the direction of the show is on me in terms of we're only going to go the route that I'm happy to go in and where I want to take it but in terms of the actual finding of that and the finding of the material with the three of us are doing it together so we you know we skype during the days sometimes here at the moment trying to get ahead of ourselves and get a sense of what the show is um, i've done like seven or eight shows in the uk so also finding something that's different and in the same way you, have, you want to find surprises within a show because ultimately it's about surprising people there's also now this sort of meta thing of hang on i've done you know seven, eight shows, whatever it is, and you now need to surprise audiences that are coming back. So that's something along the way that's been important to sort of not make sure each show is just adhering to the same template, which is difficult when you found a template that really works. Right. And yeah, that's then veering away from that is quite exciting as well. Well, I imagine as well that, you know, you are newer to American audiences. You yeah. do have a series of, of specials on Netflix. Mm. Um, but I imagine that the less people know about you or have been, uh, you know, uh, been, been made aware of, of or seen what you do, it's probably for the better, right? Like if you have someone who's come, been to all eight of your shows, it probably becomes harder and harder to wow them in a way. Yeah, well, what we've done with this show is taken the best bits from 20 years, of, well not 20 years, whatever it is, like 15, 16, I don't know, 16 years of touring and so it started with that, to take the best bits and put them together to form one show that on paper at least is the best show I've done and then it doesn't feel like a strung together series of tricks, so it wasn't about that but in terms of its, its starting point was, uh, was that, so very much a show for a new audience. So the last show that I did in the UK which is on Netflix it's called Miracle and it was about faith healing. So in the second half I was doing faith healing, which is it, as in evangelical faith healing, which is kind of interesting because I'm an atheist, my audience is skeptical, they're not coming in expecting any of that. So that was a really interesting thing to do and it was extraordinary to perform. And the things that were happening every night were kind of amazing. But it wouldn't really work as a first time audience because I, I presume they would think that I'm just I'm just doing healing or that I believe in that, it would become a very different animal. So there are definitely sort of differences. Um, it may be with the second show that I do here, if I come back, that that'll align more with what I'm doing in the UK. But this was a really fun way of going, how can I just set out my stall and say, this is, this is who I am and what I do, without just making it about how am I doing what I do? I'm mean, still trying to keep it about, about something else. It's funny as well because looking at uh, the push and sacrifice, I mean, one was made in the UK, one was made here in America, mm. Um, mm. but I almost saw them as um, accompanying each other in a sense. And is it almost fair to say that the push almost, it makes me think that you're trying to prove that anyone can do anything when, when pushed far enough. Mm. Um, or, you know, even a terrible act if they are pushed mm. to the brink. And then um, sacrifice kind of says that people will, are ultimately good and will do something good again if they're, if they're covering pushed. all my bases. Is that like, I mean, I don't know if you approached them, obviously that way they were made a few years apart, I think, mm. right? But, um, you know, how fair is that to say about both of them? And, and is that something that you think about hum humans and humanity? Yeah, so, the, so there's two shows on Netflix and what I've, what I've done a lot over the years is created these big Truman Show style experiences for someone so they don't know they're part of a show or maybe they think they're part of one show, but actually they're part of something different. And they're going through often a quite dark experience of being psychologically manipulated through the use of like actors and big fictional environments they find themselves in, but they think it's all real, to get them to this sort of life-changing point. So that's something I've done a bit over the years. So the push is yeah, using social compliance. Could you get someone to the point of murder just by starting off with being asked to mislabel some sausage rolls as vegetarian when they're not? Could you just keep building on that? within the context of this big party he finds himself at, um, all secretly filmed, all full of actors, apart from him. Um, so that was a dark thing, on, that was on Netflix, and then this miracle, which was the stage show, which was a different sort of thing, appeared, and then we, we were looking for a new project for Netflix, and it just sort of made sense to do something that was more positive, <laughs> because the push has a, 
it, it still is, it still was very positive for the guy that goes through it. I don't want to give him any surprises of what sort of happens and how it, how it turns out. It's also a very funny show and incredibly sort of anxiety inducing if, oh. you're, if you're prone to that. Yeah, so, you're like on yeah. the edge of your seat the whole time. Yeah, it's it, I of, mean, it's I, I nauseating it. I, in a way. Yeah, like you're just wanting to see, you know, find out what happens. I know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and it was going through it and watching it play out because most of the time I'm sort of hidden in a, in a room watching it on hidden cameras. So it was kind of extraordinary, but it is essentially, it feels quite unredemptive. So we wanted to do something that was more positive. So um, this other show, Sacrifice, is about whether or not an essentially racist, um, very right-wing American guy with very strong views against illegal immigration, if not immigration generally, would um, lay down his life for, a, for an illegal Mexican immigrant, whether the, whether the process of change could be done to bring someone from that point to the, to the opposite. And it's a really moving and heartwarming thing and I, I so they were made at different times and the the uh, the point of sacrifice was not really a political point it was it was particularly in this time when we're all when we're all doing this for me it was a reminder that it's it's actually the dialogue between sides that's where truth emerges and wisdom emerges it isn't just about one side or the other. It is an apolitical show, although obviously it kind of resonates within that context, but the point of making it was, was a sort of a human point and, a, and about stepping outside of these stories, which again, like secret, is the same thing. The, what interests me are the stories that we get caught up in and the narratives that we live by and these sort of, the blinkers that they place on us and how we might just release ourselves of some of that. Your TV specials do feel, they're, they're much more of an experiment, right? You put these people, as yeah. you said, in like a, a sociological situation. Um, they feel very high stakes, you know, you're talking about bullets and things like that. The live shows are far more intimate and, and mm. feel a little bit more like uh, showmanship plays more of a, a role in yeah. that. Why would you approach those two things maybe differently? I think a big difference, well certainly with, with TV first of all, you have the, the possibility of much higher drama and yes, there's, these are often life and death situations that play out um, and because I'm creating these f fictional worlds generally, this is a, a thing I've done with mo a lot of the shows certainly is that someone's going through these things, they don't know they're going through them, then you have license to, will someone assassinate somebody, well, well, what, what do we do in these situations because if crisis reveals character, which is a, you know, a classic writing point then then deep crisis reveals deep character so putting people into these things I think says a lot about us and certainly says a lot about these people that we're kind of vicariously going through the situation with them. On stage it's very different because it's a thing that's um, there are just different constraints first of all but also it's something that gets to be rehearsed and written in a very different way it's not done on the um, on the fly in the same way so so I get to be it's much more fun, like the shows are fun and funny and joyful in a way that the TV shows can be, but they're often going to a very different place. So uh, I think it's just the nature, of the, the nature of the beast. If you sat, if you sat watching a TV show for 45 minutes, it can hit certain notes, but if you're sat in a theater for a couple of hours, it needs to hit a lot of, a lot of notes and take people to very different places. And I think your, your responsibility as a stage performer is just, is just different. I was going to say, actually, in Secret and, and other live shows that we've seen, you know, mm. taped, um, it is very much a performance, and like I think a large mm. part of it is, you know, it, it's uh, very comedic in parts. And I'm wondering, like, how did you kind of hone that side of your craft? Because that's very different from like learning how to hypnotize somebody, being yeah. a performer, and to be funny, and all of those things. Like, how did you, you know, get to this point with those aspects? It's really hard to say. I mean, I've all well, for these shows that I've done, I've worked with the director, so that's very helpful and so you learn a lot from having that other pair of eyes looking at you and, and I'm sure I'd be very different, I'm sure I wouldn't be anywhere at all if it wasn't that I was working with, it, with directors. Um, so I think over, over the years those things have settled in. I'm a different sort of performer than I was when I look back at the early shows. I got by on a sort of an energy and I think now as a performer I sort of play different notes and it's, I don't, um, I'm not trying to kind of force the show on the audience in the same way. Uh, I think I'm more, uh, more, obviously more mature as a person. I've grown up and I'm more relaxed and different. And I think that, that finds its way. So there's lots of, there's lots of things that uh, have found their way into the 
show, both from sort of an intellectual point of view, things I think are important to say, but also just just me. And then I've done them for 20 years, so it, I, you know, it becomes a heightened way of being. It has to be you. It's important. You can't. I mean, you can just sort of play a character, but then in terms of any longevity and and enjoying that for any period of time, that's difficult. So I really try and make it about. You know, this, I try and make it me, just a heightened version of me. And another thing that's happened just just recently, really, is, which sounds a silly thing to say, but to to really explore what it is to love your audience, because there's a, a thing about doing any sort of magic where you're also trying to fool people at some level, and that's a potential hostility that's there, and you feel it when something starts to go wrong. And I know something's gone wrong and the audience don't know yet. And I'm sweating and it's all falling apart and I'm trying to think, how do I get out of this? And suddenly it feels like a thousand people that are just, like they were all there yesterday. They all know how it was supposed to go and now they're just looking at me going, you fraud, we can tell. So you realise how it can turn on a dime. And I had this experience um, uh, last year when I was doing this show in, in, in England or maybe the year before where I got the same thing wrong three nights in a row. And the first time it was terrifying and I was going through all of that. But I realised... Five minutes later, oh, they're back on track, the audience, they're still laughing when they're supposed to be laughing. They didn't mind too much, in fact, maybe it was interesting to them, maybe, that it went wrong. Second time it happened, it didn't bother me so much, so I sort of kind of narrated it a bit. I said, oh, I'm, no, I'm, I'm panicking a bit now, and I, I don't know how to, and then the third time it happened, th there was no stress to it at all, because I knew it was absolutely fine. And that was like a little bit of pressure that was the last little note of tension that went, and then the next night I went out, and I thought, right, what? What, like if after 20 years of doing this, if I just love these people, what would, what would that be? It sounds a really sappy thing to say, but actually in terms of, because you have to take stuff with you out on stage and that, because that feeds into what you're doing and rather than all the other things you might be thinking about, just what, what that would be. And it really, it did change things for me and it changed the experience of doing the show. And it feels odd to find that so late in the day, but that was, that was important. See, so yes, all, all this stuff is going into a performance from night to night. I was going to say, just off what you said then is that, you know, I feel like it can apply to a lot of different careers, not just your own. Like, you're obviously a specialist in what you do and knowing all the, the steps that you're going to do during a performance. But really, it seems to me that, you know, selling it to your audience is, is almost just as important as it is the actual work that's gone into it beforehand. Again, I think all the skills side of what I'm doing in terms of technically what's involved, I just think isn't that interesting. It's interesting to me because I have to have all of that, but I don't, I don't think it's that interesting to an audience. I think ultimately there are... You, you want to see a human being, you want to connect with a human being, and you, you want to see their talent being displayed, but ultimately, whether it's an actor or a magician or a dancer or whatever, you, there's something about connecting to a human being. So, like a juggler dropping a ball from time to time makes them human again and reminds you that, oh, this is someone struggling through something that, if, God, if it was me up there, it'd be really difficult, and all those things that reset it. And I do the same thing in my show, I have the equivalent of dropping a, you know, a juggler's ball. So being a human being, which means, essentially, I suppose, struggling with something as opposed to, and this is something that Teller, you know, Penn and Teller, the mm. duo, Teller's spoken about it a lot, that if you're a magician, you can click your fingers and make anything happen. You're playing a god, and dramatically, that's really not very interesting. We relate to heroes, and heroes struggle, and they, you know, maybe end up not where they were hoping to head up, uh, head to, and um, so at some level, you find that. I think being, if you've got, if you're imparting information, how do you do that without preaching? Well, you make yourself vulnerable, so that's the first thing I do in the show is, it starts off on a vulnerable note, and those things are important to maintain. So these and these are nothing to do with magic or how you're doing your tricks, and also not making it about you. Isn't that isn't just like any job better? If you're a teacher, but ultimately you just love being loved as a teacher, and you, you're not going to be as good a teacher as if you're you're just there for the kids or the students that you're teaching. I think any job only gets better when you don't make it about you. And if you see an actor on stage and it's just all about them, that's very obvious when an actor's just just thinking about themselves and how great they're acting. Um, then we just don't enjoy their performance. I think I think everything gets better when it's not about you. Yeah, the audience is very involved in all of your live shows, uh, particularly this one. From all your years of doing that, what's been the most crucial or even the most surprising thing that you've learned about people in general? I think it's this, which really hit me a few years ago. I, so the thing that happens a lot in, in a show with audience participation is that people come up on stage and they are nervous. So what do you do with those nerves? And I noticed that when people are just nervous and a bit shaky and a bit apprehensive, because that's the normal thing to do, a whole room of people loves them because they're all kind of vicariously experiencing that. And they experience their vulnerability as a positive thing that something in you just reaches out to them. 
But when somebody comes up and turns the nerves into, well, they'll be the joker, or they'll try and spoil the trick, or they'll try, they'll do all the number of things that we just, we all do in life with, with nerves. Or they'll be very standoffish or something, or appear disinterested. The room hates them. So the first thing I learned was just as a performer, it didn't bother me if that happened because I knew everyone's sort of on my side. But at some point it sort of clicked that, oh yes, and this is what we do in life, isn't it? That it's okay to be nervous, that when we're just nervous and we're just vulnerable and we let that sit, it may feel very alienating, but actually we connect and good things happen. And the worst thing you can do is try and turn it into a, um, turn it into something else, turn it into all the nonsense that we do when we feel nervous. And it's a challenge to do that because it does feel very exposed and you're very vulnerable. But actually it's very important. I think, I think life is, you know, we're here in America, which is a very positive thinking sort of culture. And that's, I think that's fine for a bit, but what, then what happens when things go wrong? Then you've got your own failure you've got to add because you didn't believe in yourself enough to your own series of problems. And I sort of, I, I believe in a certain amount of strategic pessimism, that life is ultimately going to be difficult. At some point it's going to pull us back to the hard stuff. And at that point, we tend to feel vulnerable and we tend to feel frightened and isolated. But actually those are the times that we all at some point go back to. So it's kind of when life is doing its thing the most. And if we lean into those moments differently, then it's actually a point for real connection. There's actually something quite sublime about it, that it's, doesn't offer itself up very obviously like that, but I think, I think embracing those moments and having room for them and realizing there can be a point of very powerful connection is important. So that's something it's taught me. I mean, me, myself, and I'm sure every audience member when they walk out of the show is just very perplexed <laughs> at the end of it. Uh, but I'm kind of inter interested in what still perplexes you. What do you just want to find more out about because it just, you can't get your head around it. I've done some stuff with hypnosis in the time, in the past that's has really intrigued me, that goes against my sort of understandings really. of Putting someone in an ice bath, if hypnosis is sort of about, not playing along consciously, but, but playing along like an actor that gets really involved in a, in a part, that you wouldn't be able to do something like that. You wouldn't be able to sit in an ice bath that you know where you could do in real life. And, but having somebody do that, and little things like that have happened, so that's really intrigued me because that, that hypnosis isn't just about stage shows and putting people in ice baths, it also bleeds into our natural suggestibility in life, how we respond to things like placebos and ideas and politics and the media, all, that, all those kind of things. So that's, I think that's always interesting. I think the inner life is what interests me the most. And you know, at the moment there's so much going on at that sort of big, like pull out wide lens level in the world that it makes just me find the inner life more and more intriguing, how we respond to those things for our for ourselves, how much we need to panic, I don't know, how much, how those things balance with just ourselves and how we choose to respond to the world. That's always compelling and also I'm, I'm naturally quite introverted so I just sit, I sit very well with that um, and that kind of world. And I think that that thing of the inner life and really all the stuff that I do is just a way of showing that in, you know, a fun and entertaining way, hopefully, but it's about, that's the, that's the endlessly fascinating thing for me, is our inner lives.